hello everyone. We're going to take a different view tonight simply because when the power went off last night from somebody hitting a telephone pole or a utility pole outside of my big um, apartment complex, uh, they knocked the power out of all of the buildings here. And there are three very large buildings. Well, there's two very large and then there's about eight or nine very large townhomes. So um, the chandelier behind me, the little white one that you see up there, uh, that for some reason when the power went out, all of the bulbs uh, blew out. So we don't have that light. So we're gonna do it over here. Uh, let's get this back where we can see. You see a little bit of the turtle tank over there. Let's get started with 2 Kings chapter 4. Okay, here we go. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door uh, behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. One day, Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make him a small room on the roof and put in it a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. It's very hot in here, I have to tell you. My God, we've been sweltering and my air conditioning decided it wasn't gonna work after a while, and it's just a nightmare. Um, one day when Elisha came, he went up to his room and lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, tell her you've gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? Ollie thinks he's gonna be funny. She replied, I have a home among my own people. What can be uh, done for her, Elisha asked. So obviously Gehazi is translating. Gehazi said she has no son and her husband is old. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son just as Elijah had told her, Elisha. The child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. He said to his father, my head, my head. His father told a servant, carry him to his mother. And the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother. The boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. That's all right, she said. Now, apparently she hasn't told her husband that their son is dead. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. 
So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything's all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She's in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord, she said. Didn't I tell you don't raise my hopes? Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt. Take my staff in your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him the boy is not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back, back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite, and he did. When she came, he said, take your son. She came in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. Elisha returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in that region. While the company of the prophets was meeting with him, he said to his servant, put on the large pot and cook some stew for these prophets. One of them went out into the fields to gather herbs and found a wild vine and picked as many of its gourds as his garment could hold. When he returned, he cut them up into the pot of stew, though no one knew what they were. The stew was poured out for the men, but as they began to eat it, they cried out, Man of God, there's death in the pot, and they could not eat it. Elisha said, Get some flour. He put it into the pot and said, Save it to the people to eat. Serve it to the people to eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men, his servant asked. But Elisha answered, give it to the people to eat. For this is what the Lord says, they will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them and they ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. Just like the miracle that Jesus did with the loaves, right? Second Kings chapter 5. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. That's Ben-Hadad, unless Ben-Hadad has died. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because though through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I'm sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read this letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you'll be cleansed. 
But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? In other words, why are you sending me to the Icky Jordan? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet has told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there's no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. Then the prophet, the prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down and he's leaning on my arm and I have to bow there also, when I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman this Aramean by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I'll run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running towards him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He said. Everything's all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere. Gehazi answered, but Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds or male and female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It became as white as snow. Second Kings 6. The company of the prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to meet. And he said, Go. Then one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied, and he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh no, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. The man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. Now, the king of Aram was at war with Israel. And conferring, after conferring with his officers, he said, I'll set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel. In other words, who's the traitor here that keeps warning Israel? None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers, but Elisha, the prophet who's in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He's in Dothan. 
Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I'll lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. Now these are Aramaeans, right? When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Don't kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you've captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and after they'd finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. There was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver. In other words, they're starving because they're blocked in, okay? And a quarter of a cab of seed pods for five shekels. Now, a cab is C-A-B, and that must be another unit of weight. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, Help me, my lord, the king. The king replied, If the lord doesn't help you, where can I help get help for you? From the threshing floor? From the wine press? Then he asked her, What's the matter? She answered, this woman said to me, give up your son so we may eat him today and tomorrow we'll eat my son. This is famine, folks. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, give up your son so we may eat him, but she'd hidden him. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. As he went along the wall, the people looked and they saw that under his robes he had sackcloth on his body. He said, may God deal with me, be it every, ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Okay, let's remember who this is. This is Israel. Okay, so he's angry because um, Aram has attacked them now, and he's made them start to starve, okay? Now Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him. The king sent a messenger ahead, but before he arrived, Elisha said to the elders, don't you see how this murderer is sending someone to cut off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold it shut against him. Is not the sound of his master's footsteps behind him? While he was still talking to them, the messenger came down to him. The king said, this disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? So, Here's Elisha, who's just sent um, the troops into Samaria, and they got sent home. I'm trying to think how this goes. Okay, I'm going to sum it up. First, Elisha does something good for the king, and now the king wants to kill him because he's blaming the Lord for the famine that's happened because of the siege by Ben-Hadad of Aram, by the Arameans, Okay. Let me just look back. Oh, let's finish up. Okay, so this is chapter 7. Last one for tonight. Elisha replied, hear the, Lord of the word. hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a seah of the finest flour will sell for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning at, said to the man of God, look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? You'll see it with your own eyes, answered Elisha, but you will not eat any of it because this king came to behead him, right? Now, there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? 
if we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we'll die. And if we stay here, we'll die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. At dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents and ate and drank. Then they took silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. Then they said to each other, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news and we're keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let us go at once and report this to the royal palace. So they went and called out to the city gatekeepers and told them, we went into the Aramean camp and no one was there. Not a sound of anyone. Only tethered horses and donkeys and the tents just left there as they were. The gatekeepers shouted the news and it was reported within the palace. The king got up in the night and said to his officers, I'll tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know we're starving, so they've left the camp to hide in the countryside, thinking they'll surely come out and then we'll take them alive and get into the city. One of his officers answered, have some men take five of the horses that are left in the city. Okay, so a siege is... Um, the routing king, the one who's attacking the city, they're building a fortress around it. They want to get in, okay? And they're not letting anyone out. In the same token, the king inside the siege in the city is trying to protect his city, even though he can't get out, okay? So it's just like this great, great loggerhead around the city, you know? They're walling them in and they're trying to keep them out so it is what it is okay um yes yeah, so they'll only be like all these israelites who oh excuse me then we'll uh, they'll surely come out and then we'll take them alive and get into the city one of his officers answered have some men take five of the horses that are left in the city their plight will be like that of all the israelites left here yes they'll only be like these Israelites who are doomed, so let us send them to find out what happened. So they selected two chariots with their horses, and the king sent them after the Aramean army. He commanded the drivers, go and find out what has happened. They followed them as far as the Jordan, and they found the whole road strewn with clothing and equipment the Arameans had thrown away in their headlong flight. The Lord has done this, right? So the messengers returned and reported to the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. So a sea of the finest flour sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley sold for a shekel, as the Lord had said. Now the king had put the officer on whose army leaned in charge of the gate, and the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died, just as the man of God had foretold when the king came to, down to his house. So he went to behead him, and he ended up being the one who died, okay? It happened as the man of God had said to the king, about this time tomorrow, a seah of the finest flour will sell for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officers, officer had said to the man of God, look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? The man, God can do anything, right? He can do anything. The man of God had replied, you'll see it with your own eyes, but you won't eat any of it. And that's exactly what happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gateway and he died. Okay, so I want to go back to the sixth chapter and I want to look again. Here we go. I want to go look again at what happened. Now, the king of Aram was at war with Israel. Uh, okay, the man of God sent word, beware, blah, blah. They said, Elisha can hear you in your bedroom. Elisha is the one telling the king of Israel. Okay, so Elisha led them away from their attack on Israel and brought them into Samaria. So here Elisha has rescued Israel 
And now that Israel is being attacked again, the king is really after him and is going to go cut off his head. And Elisha's like, no, it's going to be you who's going to die because you're blaming the Lord for this. And you shouldn't be because the Lord just gave you a victory that I helped you with before this. Okay. All right. So I love you very much. I'll see you tomorrow. Don't forget to pray. Keep that conversation going with the Lord. Bring him with you everywhere you go. I always do. It makes life more fun when you know God is there and you're honoring him. I love you and I'll see you tomorrow. Good night.